Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 16, 13 through 16. As a, a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, uh, as a church uh, in these days, filled with uncertainty and chaos, uh, a polarization, a, a, an incredible opportunity uh, for the church to be the church. What is our response? How are we to relate to the world and in the world, especially in these days? And Jesus answers the question this way. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do you light a lamp and put it under its bowl. Instead, you put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Blessed be the reading of God's Word. How do we relate and respond in these days? You are the salt of the earth. Uh, You are the light of the world. And before I kind of practically apply those two metaphors, I, I do want to ask us, who is you? Uh, you, who, who is the you? Uh, the you is those who are blessed because they're poor in spirit. It is you who are mournful. But, but in order, instead of going through all of those, I would simply say this. You individually and together are those saved by grace, indwelt by the Spirit of King Jesus, empowered into this world to live out Christ's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Who is you? You are like salt to the ancient world, essential and valuable for seasoning and flavoring and preserving and purifying and fertilizing. You are like light to the cosmos. Who is you? You is important. You is essential. You is invaluable. You, saved by the grace of King Jesus, indwelled by His Spirit, called out to live as a masterpiece out into the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, I personally think that 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 uh, that, that teaching is, is pretty clear. It's pretty simple. Salt cannot be worth anything unless it is contacting that which it seeks to preserve, flavor, season, fertilize. Light is penetrating into the world. It's pretty simple and it's pretty clear. It is a call into the world, even in these days, to live out our following of Jesus in our life, work and play, in our relationships, and into the world. But sometimes... What is very simple and clear in the Scriptures gets very blurry and complicated, especially as we seek to live out in this world. And there are two, two struggles uh, that, that for 2,000 plus years the church has had with its call out into the world. The, the, the first struggle, the first mentality is... Let's keep the salt in the shaker mentality. The salt is for the family Christian table. The salt is what we need to make sure that the the moral and theological purity of the sodium chloride is 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 right is worth a chemist's work. You, uh, you, you yes, do good things, but. But your, your faith is, is private, it's personal. 
You, you, don't, you don't live out the Christian faith into the world. That's something that, that you have, that, that what all of those scenarios and many more have in common is keep the salt in the shaker, put the light under the ball, separate and retreat from the world. And the second mentality is not separate and retreat from the world, but pour out all the sh- salt out into the sand of this world, capitulate and accommodate to the world. I mean, we're in the 21st century, and we need to make sure in these days that the salt is, uh, the saltiness of our lives is a little more tasty, that the, that the, uh, uh, that the, um, uh, the, the, the light is not too exposing and dispelling of the darkness. You know, that's the old mentality of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees is, let's be holy, let's be orthodox, let's not be in the world. The view of the Sadducees, let's be in the world, but capitulate, conform, and accommodate the world so that we might have. And so those two mentalities have been around since the church began. And of both of them, I would suggest that Jesus would say, you can't put your light under the bowl. You've lost your saltiness because uh, how can it be salty? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world is our call to relate in and to the world as a believer in Christ. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the only place to follow Jesus is into the world. Now my question today is how, how, how do we do that? How do we seek to, to use a uh, name of a book by Haddon Robinson, which is a great book on the Sermon on the Mount, Christ, Salt, and Light Company. How do we seek to live salty Christian lives, to be the light of the world into our lives, into our relationships, into our work, into our play. First of all, diminish salty rhetoric. Develop salty relationships. Throwing salty gospel grenades from the safe bunker of a church out into a decaying world is not salty, and it does not work. Getting behind the safe confines of our social media platforms and detonating social and moral bombs in the name of Jesus not only is not salty and it doesn't work, it leaves collateral damage for those who are genuinely seeking uh, to be salt and light in the world. Diminish the rhetoric... And I think all of us, whether it's from the pulpit or from the pundit or from the politician, we're all a leery, a little weary of rhetoric. Amen? Daggum right. I say amen to myself. Even if y'all don't say amen. <laughs> Develop salty relationships. For example, uh, Dan Cathy, who's the owner of Chick-fil-A several years ago, was asked in an interview what uh, his view on marriage was. And he said it's a, it's a traditional view. It's a biblical view. And, and that unleashed a firestorm against Dan Cathy and against Chick-fil-A. And, um, and there were protests, still are protests all over the place uh, against Chick-fil-A. And, and a politician seized on these protests several years ago and had a protest of the protest. In fact, my son, uh, Andrew was working at the Chick-fil-A in Gastonia, North Carolina on the day of the protest of the protest. He said it was absolutely crazy. And Dan Cathy did not participate in any of that. He didn't want anything to do with the protest of the protest. And in fact, he said, when you fight fire with fire, it becomes more fiery. I mean, I love uh, Ravi Zacharias used to say all the time, God rest his soul, when you throw dirt, you lose ground, and you get dirty. And so instead of participating in the protest of the protest, he met with the man who was the catalyst for the protest against Kathy and Chick-fil-A and who had been his 
uh, the one that had most effectively demonized him, and he met with him, Shane Windemeyer. On the day of the protest of the protest, he met with Shane Windemeyer and sought to develop a relationship. Several months later, uh, Windemeyer said in the Huffington Post, he says, I'm coming out of the closet. I am a friend uh, of, of, uh, of Dan Cathy. You see what I'm saying? If, if we would learn how to uh, develop relationships, maybe with people that don't think like us, that don't look like us, uh, that don't act like us, that don't have uh, a, a socioeconomic uh, uh, place uh, that is similar to us, and simply, uh, as James says, be quick to listen uh, and, and slow to speak. I mean, there are reasons why people can't stand Christians. And sometimes it's because of a spirit autonomy and they don't want anything to do with Jesus as Lord and Savior. Sometimes it has nothing to do with Jesus and more with those who have been called to represent Jesus. Diminish the salty rhetoric. I would say diminish the salty language, but I've been around here for long enough to know that that's pretty hopeless with this crowd. <laughs> Develop salty relationships. The, the second one is this, uh, a faithful presence, a faithful presence. Um, 586 B.C., uh, Babylon conquers uh, uh, Jerusalem, and uh, they exile the Jews out of Jerusalem, and um, and the Jews, for the first time in centuries, were a minority population and a minority culture. And they, they did not know uh, what to do. And the Babylonians' strategy uh, was not annihilation, like those who had come before, the likes of the Assyrians. It was assimilation. And that's always the strategy of Babylon, to conform us those in the world, to the world. You know, they, had a, they wanted to uh, uh, exile Jews and make good Jews into good-thinking, acting, living Babylonians. In fact, they plucked out some of the best uh, of young men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They trained them up. They taught them how to learn to think and act like Babylonians. I mean, they were rising up and they got into trouble not for believing God, but for bringing their belief in the one true God out into the public arena. And that's what got them thrown into the lion's den and into the fiery furnace. You see, the Babylonian perspective on the exiles was assimilation. The Jewish perspective, what was it? God, bring your wrath and judgment to Babylon. In fact, in, in Jeremiah 28, we learn about a prophet named Hananiah who began to preach, a false prophet, who began to preach uh, in two years, uh, God's wrath and God's judgment is going to come. And in two years, the Jews are going to return to Jerusalem. You know, uh, those kinds of preachers and politicians and pundits, they were popular back in 586 B.C. and they're popular today. You know, people, when people are filled with confusion and uncertainty and anger, when they feel like the world has left them, that once they had influence, now they have none, they are now a minority people and a minority culture, you, you get embittered and you get angry and you get filled with rage and you become very vulnerable to those who have pulpits and podiums and platforms, that was three Ps right there, that tell you what you want to hear, all what you need to hear to appease your anger. And God in those days raised up a word for the exiles uh, in uh, living in Babylon. Uh, a, 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 a strategy to be salt and light in, in Babylon. 
You see, God told him to trust him. You know, God, God, God will deal with Babylon in his days. I mean, that, 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 I'm not diminishing God's judgment or God's wrath, but that's his business, not ours. And he calls his people by their name. He said this to Israel. This is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel. Those who I've carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon... And I won't read the first one. I just want to highlight the, the highlighted version. Seek the peace and purity, uh, peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You, you see what he's saying? Be faithful where you are. Bloom where you, you're planted. Do not capitulate. Do not conform to Babylon, but neither separate or retreat from Babylon. No, be salt and light. Be His faithful presence while you're in Babylon. Pray for Babylon and be God's presence. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible is God, the, word, the Scriptures are never playing it out like we would. Uh, Augustine said the history is the tale of two cities, the, the city of, of man, the, the secular city one might call it today, and then there's the city of God, and the city of God are those who have salt and light, those who have been loved to life by grace, united and connected with others within cities so that we're a, a city within a city. Oh, I know we want to do good things and great things and things that are going to get us on, on, uh, on our social media platforms or wherever, but, but God's word to his exiles in Babylon, a faithful presence. Thirdly, Salt flavors, doesn't it? I mean, you, you, salt, salt is not a, an entree. Y'all with me? It, it is an additive. Uh, you say, pass me the salt in order to put on something to bring out the seasoning, the flavor of uh, the entree, and that's what we're called to do, the kind of people with, that build the kind of relationships that have influence within our groups, within our classes, within our communities, in order to flavor, to bring out the best on light. Light brightens. That this light is so bright I can't even see any of you. Light brightens. It lifts people's moods. I mean, you think of uh, someone with a seasonal affective disorder, that their depression is coming from the lack of sunlight. And so much of people's discouragement and, and anxiety and anger, we, we have the power within our beautiful words, within beautiful deeds, within small things, to, to be a light in a communication. To, to be a light in a conversation, to be the light of Christ in, in a group or a class or, or, or a relationship. When, when, when the light of Christ begins to grow and, 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 and the saltiness of Christ begins to take hold, we are people that, that lift people's moods, that bring out the best in relationships and groups. Fourthly, our light is derived from the light of Christ. Uh, this is not some cosmic metaphysical light that inherently dwells within us. This is the light of the gospel of Jesus indwelling us, the light of His Spirit that fills us, that we grow a relationship with the One who is the light. You see, we're like the moon. The moon... Uh, has no light in and above itself. It only reflects the light of the sun, and so it is with us. And, and we, we need to spend time uh, with the Son, Jesus, to abide with Him and He with us in order that His light might fill us and re be reflected in us. 
We need to learn how, how to pray and then seek after the truth of the Scriptures that the light of Christ, the light of God's Word might lighten, enlighten our lives, enlighten our paths. The, the light of Christ that brightens up others and lifts others' moods come as we spend time with the One who is the light and the life and the great lover. Fifthly, uh, light uh, exposes darkness. And uh, the, the light of Christ, uh, as He grows His light in us, uh, so that we reflect more of His light, exposes darkness. And, and I've never been one to, 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 to let the news dictate what I teach and preach, but I do think these are days, and I've tried to be pastoral in my teaching and preaching in the last months with this whole crazy COVID thing, but, but I do think these days are days where we ask Christ, your light works in us, your spirit works in us, show us if there is within us racism or a spirit of, of, of elitism. Or as Scotty Smith, to, to show us if there is in us a ethno-fearfulness, a skin-colored prejudice, or a my tribe kind of arrogance. You know, if we have racism in our hearts, if we have a spirit of elitism in our hearts, if we look down on those who do not think and believe like us, that's one thing. But when God's Spirit gets a hold of us, He exposes that. It's okay to acknowledge that's your struggle. It's not okay to remain. You ask Christ to not only expose the darkness, but to give you strength to expel the darkness. You know, the Christian life and, and the church cannot be a part of... of of being light unless we expose our own darkness. We cannot be people that, that, that preserve or season or fertilize or, or preserve and, unless there is the presence of Christ's saltiness within us. Oh, these are days not for rhetoric, but for humility to own up to the darkness that may, maybe it's latent, maybe it's overt. A good way to measure it is listen to your words. Listen to the words we think and our own motivations. And, and uh, lastly, the light of the gospel. The, the light of the gospel message. I mean, God who made light shine out of darkness has made His light shine in our hearts so that we might have the light, the knowledge, and the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That that light would indwell us. Not the light of a philosophical kind of idea, but the light of a person who lived and died and rose again, ascended to heaven, and sent His Spirit to dwell in us. The light of the gospel message that the one who is light, who is life, who is love, came in person, lived, died, took every bit of the darkness over our lives and in our lives, and then rose again gloriously so that all who would trust in Him may, may be spiritually alive. That those who are in spirit, your darkness may be brought into the light and the life and the love of the light and life giver. And the message of the gospel is not just a message that brings uh, conversion and, and sanctification, but the message of the Christ cross and the resurrection is that which brings um, a transformation, not only in our own life, but through him to bring transformation. I think of John Newton. 
a wicked man. He sold and bought human beings. And God opened his heart to the gospel, the gospel of grace that transformed him from a slave owner into one of the most well-known pastors in England. But he never forgot who he was. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When he died, before he died, he was asked, how do you want to be remembered? He said, I want to be remembered. I was a great sinner. And I have a great Savior. When William Wilberforce became a Christian, he went to John Newton, who was his pastor at the time. And... Um, well, Wilberforce said to him, I, I want to get out of politics. He was in Parliament and one of the, uh, uh, one of the leaders uh, in, in Parliament, he said, I want to get out of politics. It's a dirty business. True of the early 8, 19th century as well. And, uh, and Newton said, no, don't, don't, get out of the don't get out of the business of politics. Work with all of your energies to do away with the very evil uh, of slavery. And God used Wilberforce, who had influenced, been influenced by Newton, who at one time was a slave trader, to be the very one uh, that led England to abolish slavery several decades before America did. You see, my point is, the message of the gospel is power. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed to share it. Be careful how you share it. Uh, we want people to receive Christ. And if people are going to reject Christ in these days, may it be because they don't want anybody to be their Savior. They're their own Savior. They don't want anybody to be their Lord. They'll be their own Lord. Let them reject Christ, not because of the matter in which we have shared and spoken and represented Christ to them. To do so, to share the gospel with humility, to do so with gentleness, to do so with respectfulness. The light of the gospel. And one, one other word, and then maybe a brief other word. Uh, it's hard in these days because we want to see change. And, and for the Christian, it's just so important uh, that we have a right perspective. A person who is light, who created light and who embodies light has entered into the world. He lived and died and rose again and ascended to heaven. He sent His light to dwell within us. And One day He's going to come again and the book of Revelation says there will be no more darkness. But until then, we seek to be salt and light in a world that is filled with some measure of suffering and pandemics and racism and a lot of ugly stuff. One day, there will be none of that. One day, there will be no more darkness. Our call is to try where we are within our lives To be salt and to be light. And, and when it's all said and done, to, to be able to say with, with, with a Florence Nightingale whose life God used in a mighty way, she said, when I die, I, I want a, a, a simple cross to bear witness of my Savior and my name's only listed as initials in order that people would remember and see my good deed. And praise my Father in heaven. Oh, Spirit of Jesus, you who called us to be salt and light, you who have brought light to shine within us so that we might have your light. May the light and the beauty of Christ grow in us so that we might be people who live in our world and the world as salt and light that men and women and young people and children and life work and play at school or wherever would see our lives and praise you oh glorious father
in heaven. For we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.